and I am very excited about today's ULVLC session, which is kind of um, a partnership with Sam's um, library instructional technology training. Um, but Sam did a version of this for ACERL uh, a couple weeks ago, I guess, uh, and I asked her if she would do uh, an, a version for us um, because I think this is something that many of us are thinking about um, and want to know more about as we start to move into the semester. Um, so as usual, with our ULVLC sessions, I know they are fewer and farther between now, but I'm sure you remember, you can use um, the chat if you have any questions. I will be monitoring chat while Sam is presenting so that she's not trying to do both. Um, and I can hold your questions until um, we are at a good stopping point. Um, and I think that's it. With that, I will turn it over to Sam. Okay, great. So hello everyone. It's Sam. Y'all know me, the online learning librarian. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about inclusive teaching and design practices in online learning. Um, so I, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, and I wanted to give a little disclosure. Um, I am a white cis identifying woman and this conversation is important to have with the diverse set of librarian voices, including, including uh, BIPOC, Black and Indigenous people of color. And I am sorry I was not able to like get a variety of panelists on this. Um, I, for the ACL one, tried to get um, a panel together so that, you know, people wouldn't think I um, think I'm the only voice on this. Um, I'm not. So I hope that having this conversation with you all um, kind of brings uh, this conversation to have a variety of representation in the future about this important topic of online teaching and inclusive teaching um, online. So um, here's the presentation link. Actually, and that might actually take you to the ACRL webinar. Um, so I can fix that later. I don't think I fixed it, but it will still be the same stuff. Um, the only thing is I did add a bibliography to this. So um, I'll update the Go link in a little bit, just so that it includes the bibliography that I made. So to start out, um, just to kind of see what we're all here to learn about. Um, Y'all are probably very used to this today, but you can go to on your phone or on your computer to www.menti.com and then the code is 4373948. Uh, this is the first time Minty gave me that little eight at the end. So exciting stuff. So just take a second. So really what I'm asking here, I know it's not a huge group. Um, so hopefully it won't take too long. I'm asking your experience level with thinking about um, online learning um, and inclusive online learning and design. And I'm also going to ask like, what are we, what do we want to learn about today? So I make sure I try to cover that. So people are filling things out. So people feel like they are pretty good with online learning instruction, but good. We're going to talk about that. And then um, people don't feel like they're an expert on, oh, sorry, I spelled it wrong, inclusive teaching and design. Um, but uh, that's good. We're going to talk about all that stuff today. Um, and really, like, there's a lot of literature out there about online learning and library instruction. And then separately, there's a lot of literature out there about inclusive teaching and design. But I couldn't find a lot um, where they intersect. So that's what we're really going to talk about today. And we're going to go over kind of the theory behind a lot of stuff. And we're also going to go over specific strategies you can do if you're um, leading an online session uh, to be more inclusive. So what are you hoping to learn today about inclusive online teaching and design? Um, and again, this is just so that I can make sure I cover some things. And if I'm not planning on covering it, um, I can direct y'all to resources uh, to help with this stuff. Uh, make sure I got that. Okay, so someone said how to make sure my online learning accessible and inclusive, specific tools to use. Yes, we're gonna talk about tools. I want some inspiration for synchronous and asynchronous teaching this fall. Great, I'm gonna talk about specific strategies for both. Um, someone's talking about activities that are nice and accessible. Yes, we're gonna talk about accessibility, which of course is a um, huge part of being inclusive in your online teaching and design. Uh, but I'm gonna mostly link you out to like full on presentations about that. And then we're gonna mention it in terms of um, wrapping it up within this inclusive online teaching. Um, 
So if people are just here to get some ideas, great. Best practices, great. We're gonna talk about emerging ideas, best practices. I've even added to this since I did that uh, ACERL webinar. Uh, so y'all are getting the um, cutting edge stuff that I hear about. And I'll keep adding to it, um, especially that bibliography that we'll talk about in the end. Okay, thank you all for taking the Minty. Okay, so just to make sure we're all on the same page, inclusive teaching refers to the ways in which pedagogy, curricula, and assessment are designed and delivered to engage students in learning that is meaningful, relevant, and accessible to all. It embraces a view of the individual and individual difference as the source of diversity that can enrich the lives and learning of others. So inclusive design refers to design that considers the full range of human diversity with respect to ability, language, culture, gender, age, and other forms of human difference. And this is a really great webinar um, by Jess Mitchell, who's with Inclusive Design and Research Center. It's in Canada, British Columbia, the BC campus. Um, they have a whole webinar series on inclusive design, and Jess Mitchell uh, started it off with talking about this design, this. Um, this definition right here. Uh, so definitely check that out if you wanna learn more about it. It's an hour long. So a lot of y'all mentioned accessibility in the poll at the beginning. So accessibility is of course very important. And a lot of times when we talk about it, we're talking about it in terms of ADA compliance, right? So making sure we're accessible under this ADA um, law of that we should have to make everything accessible, whether it is online or face-to-face -face instruction. And also something called WCAG 2.0 or 2.1, which are web standards about accessibility. Um, so again, there's not time in an hour to really talk about everything I want to talk about with inclusive online design and teaching and accessibility. So I linked out to this accessibility for all presentation that I do a lot. Um, for Lyricists and other companies um, that, you know, uh, ask me to do this. Uh, but it goes into detail about what is um, WCAG 2.0 or 2.1, uh, the web standards, and it also gives you links out to all the examples, um, as well as, uh, you know, what you can do with all of your websites, including LibGuides, uh, to make sure that you're accessible, not just with like alt text and screen readers, but also thinking through like keyboard accessibility um, and different neurological um, points. So it really goes over a lot of that stuff. And I'm going to talk about a lot of um, universal design for learning in a second. But again, if you want more details about accessibility, that is your link. So thinking through accessibility a little bit, thinking again, a lot of times when I talk about accessibility, when I do these trainings, when I talk to faculty, a lot of them are like, well, yeah, I've had a blind student. Um, but student populations are, it's, accessibility isn't always a blind student or a deaf student. Um, they, if you go out to this link, it actually links you to the, North, uh, the Center for Education Statistics, where they show you um, the most current statistics on disabilities in higher education. And actually the largest one is um, neurological, right? It's um, these kind of uh, different learning styles, preferences, things that happen within students as well. So th thinking through that is important. So over 42% of American students take at least one online class. So if we think of, and I think that, <coughs> excuse me, statistic was taken from like fall of 2017. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but of course, in 2020, uh, in our current life, I'm sure that number is just what, at, at least like 90 <laughs> in America right now. Um, so thinking through that, um, it's very important to make sure our um, online stuff is, is accessible as well. And there's also an increase in non-traditional students, which are typically working adults, veterans, and transfer students, which means that they have a variety of things going on in their life, even beyond, uh, you know, a disability, right? So stuff of like childcare, um, uh, working adults, things like that, caregiving responsibilities in general. Um, so kind of being able to adapt and think through your online learning, thinking about that is important. So just a quarter of students who receive help for their disabilities in high school acknowledge in college that they need some kind of assistance, which means only 17% of students who probably need help from an Office of Accessibility are disclosing it, um, which means that there's a lot of students out there that probably do have an accessibility issue that are not telling anyone, which again shows you that we just need to be accessible. So that rolls into this idea of invisible disability, right? So a lot of times, again, when we think about um, accessibility and disability, we're thinking about a blind student, a deaf student, but it's not always a physical, mental um, condition um, that is visible from the outside and that can limit and challenge a person's movement, senses, or activities. Um, and there's a link here to the Invisible Disabilities Association if you want to learn more about that. 
So another thing that comes up a lot with inclusive online learning and design is this idea of implicit bias, which I know probably a lot of y'all have been to other training sessions that talk about implicit bias. Um, but implicit bias in education refers to unconscious attitudes, reactions, stereotypes, and categories that affect behavior and understanding. Um, so it also it talks about unconscious racial or socio socioeconomic bias towards students, um, which can be as frequent, if not more frequent, than explicit bias. Um, so some examples of that that I think are important to look through um, is that instructors may assume that certain students know to seek help when they are struggling, although students at higher risk for struggling academically are often less likely to seek help and support. Instructors may assume that students from certain backgrounds or social groups have different intellectual abilities and or ambitions. For an example, an instructor might assume that a student from a certain background will be satisfied with lower achievement levels. Instructors may expect students who speak with certain accents to be poor writers. Students with substandard writing abilities may be stereotyped as lacking intellectual ability. Instructors might treat students with physical disabilities as if, they, as if they may have a mental disability and thus require more attention. Students who are affiliated with a particular identity group may be treated as experts on issues related to that group. Instructors may assume that students will best relate to the historical, contemporary, or fictional character who resembles them demographically. Students of certain groups may be expected to have certain participation styles, quiet, argumentative, agenda-oriented. And more, right? This is just some examples of things that come up a lot in higher education. And of course, in terms of we think about library instruction, it can come up with us as well. So what are some ways that um, online teaching, either synchronous or asynchronous, is not inclusive? Um, Y'all could just put some stuff in the chat. Um, and we're going to talk through, again, now um, some strategies, some design strategies to talk through that. Um, so when we're thinking about online teaching, we're thinking about, um, again, like making a video, making a tutorial, a website, a LibGuide, or synchronously, like here we are in Zoom um, doing a session. So yeah, Jenny mentioned not everyone has internet access. Yes, um, Guilford County Schools is dealing with that a lot. Patrick, um, my husband, was telling me the other night about how like they're hiring people to drive buses with hotspots. Um, so that's interesting. So yeah, potential screen design, fonts, colors, etc. Yes, design. Um, so yeah, Carolyn's mentions dependent on good writing skills. Yes, yeah, and people come in at different levels. Um, yeah, Joe mentioned, yes, live cap presentations aren't often captioned. Yes, I um, could be doing that now. My bad. I can turn it on too. Text heavy for folks with dyslexia. Yes. Yes. Great. Okay, a lot of good points. Now we're gonna talk through again now some design strategies. Limited discussions, digital divide, yes. Yes, John. Okay, so we're gonna talk now about universal design line for learning, otherwise known as UDL. So this is an approach to curriculum that minimizes barriers and maximizes learning for all students. So um, how? So here's an article um, called Practical Strategies for Making Online Library Services and Instruction Accessible to Patrons. So again, a lot of y'all mentioned in that Minty that you want some practical stuff to practice. This is a great article um, from one of my favorite journals, Journal of Library and Information Services and Distance Learning. Um, so it's a little bit dated. It was written in 2013, but it still has some good solutions because they really focus heavily on UDL. Um, so thinking about the idea that the great thing about accessibility is that all learners have a better experience when accessibility features are utilized in online instruction materials to ensure that learners experience these barriers have access. So the question is, what steps can be taken to make online learning more accessible? So here it is too, thinking about it in terms of like uh, visual pictures. Um, so the universal is that it is meant for everyone, no matter who you are, what your learning style or preference is, right? And then in terms of design, we all know by now that if you design a space for everyone, um, right, in terms of whatever physical abilities they have, then it's better for everyone. Um, so uh, that is a standard that's been a standard that has been proven over and over again with architecture. So it's the same with learning. And then uh, the last picture is this picture of the brain, which shows you that our brain kind of hits these different things and the ideas of recognition, skills and strategies, and caring and prioritizing. And it's important for our instruction 
uh, to think through hitting students in these different ways, not hitting, that's probably the wrong word, but reaching students in these different ways. So UDL then asked us to think through how we can make our instruction provide multiple means of representation, action and expression, and engagement. So um, now that we've defined UDL and what it does, I'm going to talk about equity and creating these inclusive online spaces. So this is from a webinar that I went to uh, and helped moderate but did not present on um, deficit or equity, decoding implicit thinking and practice in information literacy, teaching and learning by Amanda Folk and uh, Sarah Miller, both librarians, um, one at the Ohio State University and one at Michigan State University. So what they're talking about here is this idea of moving from the idea of thinking through our patrons or our students as having a deficit and then thinking more, shifting more into the equity culture. And they adapted this uh, table from um, a, ben a Ben Cement article, Closing the Achievement Gap in higher education and organizational learning perspective uh, that if you haven't read it and thinking through these kind of bottlenecks and um, issues with students that it is good to read. Um, so yeah, Jenny said that was a great webinar. It really was. Um, so if you think about students with a deficit, we're focusing on stereotypes, blaming students for their backgrounds, achievements, and we're looking through remediation or this idea of fixing the student. If we shift to thinking about diversity, which is what a lot of people in America are thinking about right now, we're focusing on the representation and frequency of differences. There's a celebration of diversity coupled with colorblindness, and then there's workshop sensitivity training, this idea of fixing the workers, fixing librarians. Um, but in an ideal world, we actually really want to push it further where we're pushing it towards equity um, and thinking about equity when we're doing this kind of instruction with our students um, online or face to face, where we're focusing on these structures that process that create inequity. We're looking at institutional responsibility for systematic racism and we're looking at institutional accountability for equity looking to fix the culture. So in an ideal world, we're really pushing past um, again, this idea of uh, training for or looking at the deficit and diversity for pushing towards equity. And again, um, I put a, the, um, uh, the citation here um, and I'm happy to send you a link to this webinar. They went through a lot of activities um, to think through your library instruction. It was pretty good. Like Jenny said, it was a nice interactive webinar. So here's a um, thing y'all have probably seen a lot. I talk about a lot. I love this, uh, you know, image uh, thinking through equity in this way. Uh, but when you think through equality, right, which is like everyone deserves the same service. Everyone deserves the same instruction, right? You're thinking about just providing everyone the same box. But of course, not everyone needs the same box or, you know, everyone's coming at different levels. So if we think about equity, we're providing people what they need to allow them to achieve their goals, right? See the game, um, you know, hit their learning objectives, all that stuff. But in an ideal world, we're even pushing it further and we're removing all those barriers in general so that we don't even have to worry about the boxes, right? We're getting rid of that fence. And that is what an ideal inclusive online learning environment is pushing towards is liberation. Um, so I like that graphic. So here's some stuff that have been presented by other people that I think really help connect these ideas of online learning design and inclusive design. Um, and so uh, this is called Reflections on Universal Design for Learning in Online Environments. It's a it's an ACRL distance learning section. It's now actually called the Distance and Online Learning Section Dole's Virtual Poster in 2009 by Sam Putnam. Um, he was at Florida. I'm not sure he's there anymore. But um, ACRL's website is broken. So if you click on that, you're going to get this. But um, it will hopefully be back on and I'll make sure the link's working later. But I did link. So what it, he's doing is he's taking his library instruction with an online course and he's connecting it to these UDL guidelines, um, which is taking the philosophies of universal design for learning and giving you specific examples of how you can provide multiple means of engagement, representation, and action and expression. So what he did is he basically used this as a rubric on his online course, on an online course that was embedded with information literacy, and then uh, went through it and talked about improving it, and he shifted things to kind of hit these different um, rubric style boxes in a different way. So it's really good. And so if you're interested in this, I love this. I love UDL and I love these guidelines. Um, so I think they're very useful ways. So even if you're like, oh, how could I provide 
um, clarification of vocabulary and symbols, you can click on it and it takes you to a whole page with specific examples. Um, so if you haven't looked at this yet and you're interested in kind of improving your teaching in this way, um, again, love it. Love the UDL guidelines. Uh, check it out. Um, so another philosophy beyond UDL, but I think has some similar ideas is something called design look thinking, which looks at instructional design through the following steps. Um, emphasize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. Um, so again, um, kind of pushing past the ideas of typical instructional design like Addy, which I love Addy and all that stuff, um, but really pushing a little further. So here are two presentations from ACRL and um, yeah, both are from ACRL on design thinking and mixing it with instruction. Um, so here's one on design thinking and library support, um, where it's an infographic, where it shows you how you could think about empathy in terms of design thinking in the curriculum and also as well as support from the library. So when you think about empathy, when they're saying teaching, they're saying audience and market trend research, interview techniques, topic research, data management, and research design. Right, thinking through how you can empathize with your patrons. Um, and then uh, when design thinking, you're consulting experts, you're observing, you're role playing, you're immersing yourself in the user experience. And then it goes on and on um, how there's different examples of how you can do all these different things. Um, here's another one as well that gives you a worksheet on instruction uh, where you can use design thinking to create active learning instruction, uh, where it takes you down um, kind of these activities uh, to ask yourself about your instruction session. And it also gives you, I, I like this, this empathy map where it asks you to say, think, feel, and do during the library instruction. Um, and then uh, it has a think, pair, share, but again, you could go and do this on your own, um, creating your SLOs based on design thinking, um, brainstorming based on design thinking, storyboard, and so on. So it's a really nice worksheet. I really like it. Um, so uh, check it out. Yes, it's, it is awesome. Um, so if you haven't done this and you are in instruction, I think it's a really useful activity. Um, I've done some, uh, you know, myself when I think through tutorials or um, again through things and again it, it's worth it to at least try it once especially I think like the empathy part and that kind of thing. So now that we've gone through the design um, and the definitions we're going to go through specific strategies to do inclusive teaching with online um, that will help that I have found um, help and it also connects back to these um, design philosophies, the literature, what experts are saying. Um, that um, help us create a more inclusive environment for our students. Um, so, when you're having a synchronous session, allow students to participate in self-reflective virtual exercises so they make it become aware of their learning preferences, personality types, and preferred team roles. Um, so, a lot of this is about respecting the student, um, allowing the students to kind of um, come into their own in these sessions, um, even if you have a short amount of time development of online quizzes that reinforce um, important points and concepts and topics that are available for students to complete in their own time at that their own pace. Um, so when I was an instructional designer, I would always encourage um, faculty to not actually time their quizzes and to actually allow them to go out on the internet and search, right? Like kind of forget this whole idea of constantly stressing about plagiarism. It of course doesn't always work, um, but again, this whole idea of that students have to complete a quiz in like 15 minutes uh, typically doesn't help anyone, <laughs> including the teachers who are grading them. Um, so another strategy is provide multiple means of virtual support, right, through office hours, additional learning opportunities, extra credit, formative assessment, and of course, answering your emails. <laughs> so um, I know this is all very hard. You know, I struggle with answering my emails. This is not a call out of any um, one, again, including myself. <laughs> but um, students are stressed right now, especially, right? So giving them um, opportunities to kind of uh, flex is always really useful. So taking the implicit bias test, if you haven't taked it, um, taken it yet, we talked about some implicit bias scenarios in education. We all have implicit bias. Um, so I would recommend uh, going out to that link and taking the test on your own and kind of seeing 
th thinking through your own implicit bias to be aware. Um, but also there's strategies you can do to kind of combat your implicit bias with online teaching. If you are involved with grading, you can do blind grading, um, which is turning off the names and the pictures when you're grading within Canvas um, here, or and if you end up somewhere else, another LMS, um, which is again, a great strategy to try to think through um, that you're trying to eliminate any kind of bias that could um, hurt you in terms of that. And I would also include that when you're doing your own library assessment with rubrics. Again, this kind of blind grading or assessment. So including a variety of perspectives and diversity within your online instruction content, right? Like if you always provide the same example of a website that doesn't work in terms of information literacy or a good one or whatever, think through that. Are you kind of throw, showing a variety in that way? So some more are um, including a range of different learning, teaching, and assessment approaches and providing students with options to choose which they feel best suit them. Again, let the students choose their learning experience. Um, if you just provide um, videos, that's problematic because not everyone likes or learns best with videos. Mm -hmm. If you just provide text, right, that's also problematic. Um, try to change it up. If you're making tutorials for a department or for a course, um, think about what you can find out there, which we're going to talk about OER in a little bit, but also think about like, you know, again, providing different things um, to, you know, to provide variety. So providing opportunities for students to reflect on their own experiences and consider how these experiences influence the way they understand. And then lastly, on this page, scaffolding academic skills, learning processes and assessments, right? Build off of your past experiences um, with that. So here's some stuff about one shots, right? Um, which I get a lot when I do these webinars with librarians is that they're like, but I only have 30 minutes, um, which of course is a challenge. And you can't of course do like, all the things, right? Like, you know, provide a lot of different variety, a lot of different tutorials, um, that kind of thing. So one thing is to think through your lib guides, right? Like something in terms of that whole idea of flipping, right? Is that we all create these lib guides, lib guides are easy to use, we have access to them. Um, so thinking through how you can make your lib guides create a racial justice and support inclusive um, communities. So this is a link out to um, an article by Tawana Hodge, uh, who uh, came and spoke to us about um, a lot of, uh, about EDI um, topics. Uh, so here she talks about um, how you can kind of shift your lib guide Guides, um, academic lib guides so that they are more inclusive. And I think this is a really useful article. I sent it to all of um, ROI. Um, I know a lot of y'all aren't in ROI, but you have access to lib guides. Um, so it's really, again, a great article. Um, she also links out to this, the conscious guide, um, which I really like as well um, in here um, that um, goes through uh, thinking through your language and um, uh, things like that. So again, if you haven't checked this out, it's also pretty cool. Lots of links. Um, so also think through if you want to have um, an accessibility statement on your guide, a land um, statement on your guide. There's again, we do this stuff in our um, your pronouns available on your guides. There's a lot of things you can do on your guides to make it clear that you're supporting these kind of inclusive communities. So ask for peer review from a variety of colleagues to improve your online presence and instruction. But I'd also add the note to not like fatigue your uh, BIPOC colleagues to um, constantly like give feedback, <laughs> you know? So um, also, so when I say variety, I say a variety, right? Don't just always um, be calling on your BIPOC colleagues to, to give you feed this feedback. So if doing an asynchronous online session, ask what students audience wants to learn from the session and then adapt accordingly. So I kind of did that with y'all in the beginning with the Minty. Uh, you can just do it in the chat. It doesn't always have to be a full on poll. Um, and then kind of shift, right? If everyone or if a lot of people say, I really came here just to learn about citations, um, but you hadn't really planned citations, like, like shift and take a couple of minutes to talk about citations or more than you were planning to. And then lastly, build in time for formative assessment, right? So that's not, not graded kind of check-ins throughout the um, synchronous session or asynchronous stuff. Um, and then also provide ungraded feedback and um, give students time to reflect. So even if you're doing a one shot, kind of building in about a five minute period where students can reflect and then you get that assessment to improve um, as well as students to have time to think through what just happened uh, can be really useful. 
Okay, so we kind of talked about this throughout, but really a lot of this is talking about respecting your students, right? Respecting the patron. Uh, so we're just, you know, students are coming at us with a variety of different learning preferences, backgrounds, things going on in their life, particularly right now. Um, people are stressed, I'm stressed, everyone's stressed. So let's just respect that and give people space. Um, so here are some um, links out to either articles or specific strategies of things to think about. So transparent des assignment design is having the students help you design the assignment, right? So that they kind of tell you, this is what we want, this is what we want to learn, and thinking through it that way. So this link takes you out into how you could do that. There's also something called ungrading. It doesn't always work, um, but this is the idea of that don't grade. Let your students grade themselves. Um, and this is, and again, that's complicated, and it makes it like I, it's one of my pet peeves, people just are like, yeah ungrading. It's a complicated thing and it will not always work. But if you want to learn more about it, if you teach or you end up teaching stuff where you're working with grades, um, I would recommend uh, clicking out into here and checking it out. So this decoding the disciplines is what I talked about um, by, you know, this link takes you out into the um, decodingthedisciplines.org, which is what um, Amanda Folk and Sarah Miller were talking about in that webinar. Um, but this is a whole web page about decoding the disciplines to help improve student learning, um, which is a process for increasing student learning by narrowing the gap between expert and novice thinking, right? So getting out of this idea of that we are like these ivory tower experts um, just here to save the students. Um, and this is really helpful. Because again, I think all of us sometimes do that with our sessions um, to think through um, that through these specific strategies to help us get out of that mentality. Um, so there's, of course, open pedagogy and authentic assessment, which is taking um, having students create um, open resources, digital content instead of a research paper and um, also reflective teaching, which Jenny does a lot of sessions on that, did a session on that. Um, so if you are interested, uh, she is a great resource for that. I really enjoyed her session she did for, I think it was NCLA conference. Uh, so you could look up that recording, but this is a, um, a website from a uh, you know instructional design center at Yale on uh, what it is. So it's really a self-assessment of your teaching uh, where you're examining your own pedagogy. Okay, and there's others that I've probably missed. So if people want to throw stuff in the chat or anything, I'm happy to add to this. Um, I am not perfect. So inclusive pedagogy, um, there's also other ways to do that instruction. So here's some other things from instructional design and literature that could help. So there's anti-racist pedagogy, which I know that um, Jenny led a, or moderated a session on us reading a whole article about that. There's critical theory and also um, critical information literacy theory, sometimes called a crit lit, uh, where it's uh, thinking through how we do library instruction in a more critical way. Again, kind of hitting it at a structural level, um, really kind of building into the framework and building in social justice into our library instruction. There's also a link here to a page on trauma-informed pedagogy, which, was, which is respecting our students, our patrons, um, for any session we have and thinking through the trauma that they've been through in their life um, and respecting that and kind of shifting your pedagogy uh, to be more respectful of any trauma. And there are studies um, now that are coming out, like this links you out to this insider higher ed of leveraging the neuroscience of today, um, where uh, it's really about the trauma that's happening with our students and our patrons based on COVID-19. Um, so uh, there's this whole article on that if you're interested in it. And others that I'm again probably missing. Okay, so um, Harvard University Center has these also examples that are really pretty similar to what we went over, but just to kind of like bring them back. Work to articulate your assumptions and expectations that inform your approach to course design and teaching. If you think you're perfect, uh, that's not great in terms of uh, being inclusive with your design. So diversify your course materials. Plan to assess early and often. Plan to vary your teaching strategies. Be flexible, right, um, based on your students' needs and wants, again, in that chat. Allow students to demonstrate their learning in various ways when possible. Okay, so now we're going to shift into OER, and we are going to do one more activity at the end. Okay, we're at 11.37. That's a lot of stuff. Sorry, guys. But um, open educational resources are resources that are kind of in the public domain or have these Creative Commons licenses. That means they are not only free on the internet, like your students don't have to buy textbooks, but they're also free to reuse and readapt. So teachers can take this stuff down and they can change it up. 
right? So it helps, of course, with the cost of materials for students. Um, and uh, of course, there's more and more stuff out there. So if you used to think about OER and you're like, there's nothing out there that can help me. There might be stuff out there now. More stuff is being added every day, especially based on COVID-19 and the increase of online learning. Um, and also open pedagogy, right? Kind of shifting your instruction to have your students create these open objects that are gonna help them in terms of learning about these real life skills in terms of digital um, you know, work, but also uh, it helps contribute back to the canon of OER stuff. So here is this whole webinar on how OER can support student equity and diversity. Um, it's an hour long, uh, but if you're into this and are interested in this, it's worth the watch. Um, and then here is a uh, quote from the CCOER um, president of the time. It's the Community College OER group, um, but talking about diversity in OER, EDI and OER. But I like this quote here in that diversity in the OER sense can be introduced when we curate, remix, and revise resources into our courses. We can also leverage OER-enabled pedagogy to solicit students in creating diversity for class materials. The goal being to ensure their voices and perspectives are authentic and accurately represented. So again, thinking through how we can make our students feel respected, feel seen in these classes, um, OER can help with that, um, right? Because again, a lot of uh, academic stuff is written by uh, cis white men and OER gives us a chance to find this diversity of voices. Okay, Whew, what a ride. So we talked about some challenges and now we've been through a lot of stuff. Um, it's, we're gonna end on tools and a bibliography of all this stuff. Uh, but we're gonna do another Minty to think through these challenges again, right? Like, you know, what are the challenges? Y'all dropped them in the chat, but also like what things do you think challenges come even when I threw all this stuff at you? Um, so, uh, I think, you know, something off the top of my mind is like time um, as an example, but y'all could have different stuff or the same thing. So again, if you just quickly want to go to www.minty.com and uh, go to 785731. So one thing I'm going to do real fast that I could have done the whole time, sorry, I should have probably, but you also can, someone create, uh, mentioned before creating captions on your online synchronous instruction. Uh, that's really easy to do with Google Slides. You can just go to captions and then they are on. So um, what I've been trying to start doing with my synchronous sessions with students is have this on so that I don't even have to ask. Um, realize that when you are recording within Zoom, it also now creates a whole transcript. Uh, so if this is hard for people to follow or distracting or whatever, you can also turn it off and you'll get that transcript. But you can see from what's going on on the screen that it's pretty accurate. And it also helps me, um, this is a me problem, probably not a y'all problem, uh, but it also helps me realize to slow down and take a breath uh, to check in with my uh, students in the chat box and uh, kind of uh, put less material and more interactions in there. So again, I didn't, I don't think practice completely what I preach for this because I had a lot to cover. Um, but let's see what y'all are putting in that minty. So um, when you leave your Google slide, it goes away. So if you're doing demos, um, keep that in mind. But if you go back to a Google slide, it comes back. Um, so there are limitations. Zoom does have a captioning, but it's not um, actually great um, in terms of the live stuff. Okay. So. We always talk, we talked through a lot of stuff. So people are saying we don't always know what our students need or what issues they're facing, especially if they don't tell us. Yes, how to cater to everyone. There are so many factors to consider with instruction. Yes, keeping students engaged, especially right now. Someone mentioned limitations of Canvas, reliance on internet period is not everyone has a steady internet, making sure the professor understands why this is necessary. So having the time to prepare multiple means of engagement representation, yes. Change is the only constant, staying abreast of new developments, language, et cetera. It takes time, energy, and effort, yes. Having time to do as much as one might want in instruction. So someone said time, yes. Teaching new students who don't know what they need or their learning styles and are used to being told what they need to learn and do. 
yes to all of this. So someone mentioned here, and I think it's an interesting point, and I, when I think I, when I did the ACRL webinar, someone pointed this out as well, but um, you know, a lot of us in terms of our library instruction are working with faculty, right? Which, you know, we can't really control their implicit biases, their, um, you know, teaching style, right? If they're not very inclusive, what can we do to be more inclusive when they're kind of fighting against that, right? Um, so um, one thing I say with that is that what we can do is work with what we have, right? And what we have are LibGuides. We have good access to Canvas, um, more than a lot of libraries in America. So someone mentions limitations of Canvas. Um, Canvas is not perfect, but I will say, and I think a lot of y'all have heard me talk about this, um, we've sent surveys out to students taking online courses. Um, we haven't done it in a couple of years, we'll probably do, um, but students do not like being taken out of Canvas. They like things in Canvas. So even if you don't like it, even if you think there's limitations to Canvas, which there definitely is, no tool is perfect, um, then uh, students like it. I mean, they like to be in it. They don't think it's perfect, like we don't, but they don't like to be thrown a lot of different things. Again, students have a lot going on right now. So someone also mentioned keeping students engaged. I think it's important to think through um, being gentle on our students and ourselves. That was a lot of conversations we had in the spring when we quickly moved to online learning, right? Like you can still meet a lot of your student learning objections of a one shot of a conference presentations, but be gentle on your students, right? Give them time to go through the links later, flip your instruction, have them do one thing ahead of time and then focus the time on having a conversation with your students. Um, and again, you might not be able to do that every time, but these are just ways, things you could try. Um, you can experiment with things, and if they fail, um, I know a lot of people from ROI are here, um, some people who do instruction with archives. I'm, I mean, maybe not, maybe y'all are perfect, but like I have failed at doing an instruction session, um, online and face-to-face, -face. and that's okay because I think I get better, right? I look at that later, thinking through this reflective practice, and I'm like, that did not work because I, wanted them to do too much and too little time or it didn't work because of this. Um, so uh, again, being gentle on ourselves, but also being flexible um, and shifting and trying again. Um, so I think this is a great time to try new things. Um, so this was a lot, but the last part of it is um, really just um, links to tools. So someone I think in the at the beginning mentioned like I want resources, links to tools. So these are specific things that can help you. This is the web AIM checker. You throw a URL in there, including a libguide, and it tells you about all the accessibility issues, right, um, with it. So and then you can fix it. So it's great. I love it. I use it for everything. Um, there's also a ton of Chrome extensions that are free that help you check for accessibility. Um, so if you're interested in how contrast is, how like a colorblind person would see your stuff, um, this is, there's tons of Chrome extensions on that. So uh, the NV, NVDA screen reader is free to download, free to use, and a lot of um, it also like replicates what it's like for a student who is blind um, going through your stuff. So if you want to kind of think through that and kind of understand what it's like for visually impaired or blind students um, or patrons looking through your materials, um, this is a good tool to try. So CAS is a website dedicated to expand learning. A lot of these right here are mostly guides that tell you more about accessibility. Um, so if you wanna learn more about this, um, this is where they are. And this one right here, I will click out into it. It's called Flow Project. It's a really great resource um, about flexible learning for open education, uh, but it really goes through inclusive design. Um, it links, it's led by the Inclusive Design Research Center, which is great, they're out of Canada. And um, it gives you all these different examples as well as um, resources, thinking through usability, accessibility, and instruction and instru in inclusive design. Um, so though we went through examples today, this is really a, got a lot more like detailed in terms of specific tools, specific things, specific strategies um, that you can do to make sure your, your online learning is truly inclusive. So if you have not checked it out and you're interested in this topic, highly recommend. It's great. Um, and then here's some other stuff, right? These links to these like different um, teaching and learning centers across America that seem to have a lot of stuff about inclusive teaching strategies. It seems like a lot of their stuff right now is mostly about face-to-face, -face, but I bet they will have more stuff on there about online learning um, coming up. 
And then here is this bibliography I was talking about. So I read, I read a lot of stuff on this stuff because again, I'm not an expert. I want to learn stuff. Uh, I want to get better. And here it is. Here's all the stuff that I either quoted from, read, found um, in Zotero. Um, and I will continue adding to it and try to make it better. Um, so when things come up on listservs or whatever, I add to this, um, but it's a good place to start. It has a lot of stuff on things like critical information literacy, um, critical pedagogies, reflective teaching, um, all that stuff we talked about. Uh, again, I tried to find examples from a variety of things. Um, and if anyone has anything to add to it, let me know, I'm happy to do it. Okay. 12 minutes left. Questions, concerns, wanna um, be frustrated. It's a lot of stuff. I haven't seen any questions come in through the chat, but if folks have questions, this is a great time to ask them. I'll ask a question for people to share in the chat. What's one thing that Sam talked about today that you think you can use in your own work or your own practice, even if it's not library instruction related? So Anna says, looking forward to using that conscious style guide. Yeah, I looked at that when Sam first sent um, ROI that um, LibGuides article and I thought it was really cool. Um, Sam wants to add more statements to a LibGuide profile box. Um, Patrick likes the website checker, screen reader. Lois agrees. Sean says, I think I can take this info and share with my son's teacher as needed. That's probably a good idea. <laughs> They really are open, I think, to getting all the help they can. Yeah, I, I imagine that's the case with a lot of K-12 teachers. Um, you know, I think with anything else, it's probably just how you couch it, not like, here's how you could be better. But here's something cool that you might try that I learned about at work. Um, Anne says, awesome presentation and resources, Sam. Makes me miss teaching. I'm going to go ahead and put, that reminds me that I'm going to go ahead and put the link to the assessment form um, in the chat there. So if you have a moment to fill out a quick assessment about this, that would be super. Joe says, tip suggestion to ask students what they want to learn and then adapt accordingly is helpful. Yeah, that's something that feels kind of risky, I think, as a teacher. Um, but can be really awesome. Yeah, I mean, that's where I think, and Jenny, you're really good at this. I mean, I've seen a lot of people in ROI be really good at this, but like formative assessment, right? Like you still have a lesson plan that you're like, okay, I have to cover databases. I have to cover whatever. But then um, if you do, if you do a like demo of the website and then you do a quick, you know, like formative assessment and you're like, oh, they did not get anything about permalinks or like whatever, then you can shift and say, okay, I'm, I'm going to cover permalinks a little bit more, or if they're like panicked about permalinks. Like once I did a formative assessment in the middle and they were like really panicked about MLA, I was doing a session for Maggie and I was like, let's just take five minutes at the end and like talk through some MLA so y'all don't leave here thinking that like MLA is the worst, you know? So like just little, it doesn't have to be like a total flex or that you're like at the end, like in the beginning, like what do you want to learn about? And then like abandon your plan completely. Um, but just like slight flexes, I find help. Um, and Jenny, I, like I, I've seen you do this. I've seen a lot of people in ROI do this for sure. Maggie's good at it. Rachel's good. At it. I mean, I think we're all good at it. It's another one of those things where really it's, it's your limitation. Your main limitation is time, right? Mm -hmm. Thinking about, um, you know, if you do formative assessment, um, you got to do it early enough that you can make a difference. The other thing I've started doing, I don't know how this is on the inclusive teaching side of things, but is that I um, 
when I do something at the end, like a reflective thing at the end, and I ask students if they have any questions or, or what things are unclear, um, if I'm not seeing that class again, which is usually the case, right, it's usually the um, just a one shot, I create sort of an FAQ document um, in Google Docs and I share it with the instructor of the course. Um, yeah. to, to students, good idea. Uh, it is a good idea. It takes time and it's hard to do, especially yeah. if things are like, you know, if you got back to back classes, it kind of feels like, uh, how am I going to have time to do this? Um, but what I noticed when I started doing it is that, you know, a lot of similar questions come up um, and that makes it a bit easier. Um, yeah, and like the idea of too, like flipping your, like if you send a form, if you're, I mean, not everyone's able to do this, but sending out a form ahead of time, right? And like, it's not always like necessarily, what do you want to learn about? But like a question I have up on Minty a lot at the beginning of my instruction is, um, you know, how do you define research or like, what about research like stresses you out, right? And then at least you're making sure you're like giving them the tools they hopefully to help them like be at least more confident, you know, right? Like you can't necessarily fix everything about um, the stress in their life, but like showing them that the library can be this place of like, we're here to help. Like we're not just like these like librarians who shush people in the stacks, like, you know. Um, so that's what I have found to be useful too. But again, like sometimes faculty, if I'm like, oh, could I send out a form? Could you, you know, could I do this in Canvas or whatever? They're like, no, you know. So a lot of it depends on the faculty. I mean, I've heard stories from people that like faculty do explicit bias in, you know, teach, you know, and then you're like in the background, like, oh my God. Um, and, you know, and that's of course awful. Um, but uh, the, you know, we can just be the best we can be is something I've had to say to myself a lot <laughs> in pandemic life. Can't control other people. So yeah, Patrick says I don't get to shush enough people. It's true. I'm usually the one getting shushed. I'm too loud. <laughs> nice, Suzanne. Excellent reference. They go low, we go high. Yes. I was thinking about um, this morning when I was reading through Michelle Obama's DNC's speech. Um, she talked a lot about empathy and I was like, yes, I'm about to talk about empathy to librarians. <laughs> like, you know, I was like, me and Michelle. <laughs> All right, y'all, I don't see any other questions coming up. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording.